The Big Footy Port LA podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. Hi everyone, Macca19 here and this is the Big Footy Port LA podcast coming to you live once again on Port Fan Radio. Look, joining me as always as co-host, we well, got Fishing Rick. How are you, mate? Hi, Macca. I'm good. That's the way. Bit, bit tired. Bit tired. Tax yes. season. It's a, a hectic season. Yes, business. Business is booming. How's this? Good news. One of our close friends, Porsche, emails me tonight, and uh, so oh, Porsche's emailed me. What's she asking? She asks who who's a good tax agent I can refer her to. Oh, there you go. Nah. That's all right. It was more complicated. And you said, definitely not me. <laughs> definitely, yeah, no, don't come to me. <laughs> no, we've got her on the right track. She'll be fine. But she told me to drop a mention to the Cam O'Shea. So, Porsche, I was wrong, but we'll talk about that in more detail later. <laughs> That's it. Now, look, we are guestless at the moment. Uh, we're still waiting on our guest to come in. Uh, she'll be with us pretty soon, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get Fort Support online as soon as he comes on. No, nah, he's sacked. It's sacked. Kind of tardiness in Port Fan Radio Land. Outrageous. Letting letting the moderator team down here. It's, uh, it is it's unacceptable disgrace- behaviour. Disgraceful. So what's been going on, Macca? Not much, mate. Not much. Uh, pretty interesting weekend. Watched uh, quite a bit of footy for once. That was that Did was good. Know? What yeah, what games did you watch? Uh, obviously watched the Port game. Watched the Friday night game. Saw the Crows game. Um, and watched one of the games on Sunday as well. Yeah. So what did you think of the Crows game? Oh, look, I thought it was, uh, you know, probably to be expected, I guess. I don't know. I, I almost expected, in the first quarter when they got uh, a fair bit in front, I thought, yeah, this is this is what I thought might happen. They'll, they'll come out firing and I'm expecting a bit of a crash to come and that happened. And I don't know, I, I was actually hoping they got up in the end, but, uh, you know, it didn't happen. They, you, you could tell they were pretty mentally stuffed by the end of it. And look, I mean, those scenes at the end were uh, were pretty heartbreaking, really. Yeah, pretty sad, but uh, they all did well. What about the crowd? I thought that was fantastic of the crowd. Uh, hang around and applaud them off and, and show their support. I, you know, uh, sometimes footy supporters uh, get a bad rap and uh, I think they should get some kudos for um, uh, how they act, uh, performed and acted on the, on Saturday night. Yeah, look, I think all Port, uh, not just Port supporters, but I think all footy supporters... Um, you know, feel for the Crows at the moment and, and their players and, and what they're going through. It's certainly not a pleasant situation, not something you'd, you'd ever wish on anyone, really. But, um, you know, hopefully uh, hopefully they don't come back with a vengeance uh, this weekend. Well, while, while we're waiting for Four's report, if he comes on, we can do a bit of stalling. And um, what about uh, the around the grounds? Uh, I think there's a couple of interesting topics. We've got... Um, Sam the Nanny Man Mitchell, and we have uh, Nathan pushing the boundaries uh, fight. I mean, one more warning, and he's scrubbed out for a game, and there goes his Brownlow. It's uh, yep. What do you what do you take on those two boys? Oh, look, I think Fife's pretty lucky, to be honest. I think he's uh, he's pretty lucky. It was a, a pretty unsavoury incident. I think it was completely accidental, but an elbow in the face is still an elbow in the face. And look, if that was anyone else except for Nathan Fife, I reckon he would have got a game. Yeah, and what about? I'm just typing the fours, or he's uh, he's ready now, apparently. And Here he what is. about what about Sam Mitchell? Sam Mitchell, well, you know, twice in what three weeks he's done this, so it's clearly a bit of a strategy, and you know, hopefully at some point he'll get suspended for it. To be honest, well, do we just need the old? Remember the olden days? There used to be a, a square up. Is that oh. uh, maybe just what needs to? Be remembered. Uh, Sammy needs a uh, maybe a little whack himself to go. Hey, well, you, you little Kane flames. Corns did that two years ago, and he got two weeks for a, a nudge in the back. So I'm not sure what's all that different to uh, to this situation, really. Forza, how are you, mate? How are you guys? I'm really sorry. Here he is. It's been a hectic, absolutely hectic. I'm still trying to catch my breath. We just <laughs> we were stalling for you, so we were talking about the around the AFL and talking about. Little sniper Mitchell. Do you think he's a sniper? Oh, he's a protected species. I hate it. I hate it when 
one guy can do whatever he wants, and then when he gets some of it back, he's he can't touch him. It's mm. the most frustrating thing. I wouldn't even very say true. what I wouldn't even say what Kane did to him a couple of years ago it was even in the same category. I mean, all he all he did was sort of tap him in the back. Touch him in the back. Yeah. No. It's completely different to trying to to take someone out of the game by giving them a very corky. bad corky. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, honestly, what, what Kane did has been part of the game up until that point that everyone did it week in, week out with barely a, a whisper and then all of a sudden, bang, two weeks. It's just it's just nonsense, utter nonsense. Mm. I'm with you. That's it. Well, look, let's uh, get on to proceedings and talk about our love and hate for this weekend. And thoughts, mate, I might start with you with this one. Uh, you know, I was thinking about it this morning on the way into work, love and hate, and really there's, there's really so much to love and so little to hate, but I think mm. my love would have to be, I'll, I'll say two. Um, one is obviously the tribute to Phil Walsh at the end of the game. I thought that was remarkably well done by the club. I thought the whole video they did where they showed Phil Walsh throughout his career, not only at Port Adelaide but at other football clubs um, and as coach at the Crows and how all the lights went out and everyone had their iPhone lights on. I thought that was really special and I was really happy to be a part of it and be there with everyone commemorating uh, Phil Walsh. So I thought that was um, really well done by the club, especially in a year when things have sort of been a bit off with what we've done. I thought we actually nailed it with the appropriate level of, of respect uh, to Walsh. So that's that was the sort of the off-field love. The, on, uh, the on-field love would have to be Jack Homsch. This bloke, yep. the year he's having is just, it's something special. I, I really think we should be, as a club, sort of making a case for him to, to push for all Australian selection because... We all know how our players don't seem to have the same sort of uh, standing in the wider community, despite their you know, really strong form. And I think yeah. Homs suffer from that. But his form has just been outstanding. He's, he's our best defender of the year. He's he, he absolutely blanketed Cloak. It was just a, a phenomenal performance by him. I think, yeah. Oh, it was a top-notch performance to keep Cloak scoreless. I mean, that rarely happens. It's only happened maybe twice in the last two years. So, you know, it's something that uh, not many other defenders are, are able to do. And, you know, he's had a brilliant year. And I guess in terms of All-Australian selection, he's probably unfortunate in the fact that he often doesn't play on the best defender, uh, the best forward. I think that's that maybe counts against him. And even though he's been fantastic, I think um, you look at, Maybe someone like Alex Rance or Luke McFarlane who who do the same job on the the absolute guns of the competition week in week out and keep them you know to minimal scores as well and that's probably where he breaks down I guess a little bit in terms of those sort of talks but you know he's probably fourth or fifth in line I would think for a, a key defensive spot in the All Australian team and you know hopefully he finishes pretty high up in the uh, in the best and fairest as some sort of reward for his season. Oh, I think he'll certainly finish top three the way he's going. Um, yeah. Oh, he should be top five for sure, but I reckon, oh, no I, doubt. I, reckon I reckon he can get top three. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be bullish on him. Yep. And my Your hate... thoughts, Rick? Oh, sorry. You're right. I just was letting the little love fest go along there. <laughs> no, I, I thought it was fantastic to be at the ground for the end of the game. I mean, it was just sort of a, uh, a magical moment in... Uh, that sometimes sport uh, can can produce, and that was one of those moments. Seeing um, everyone celebrate life in unison, um, the the emotion of the the people that knew Filch uh, from a game playing perspective, and um, yeah, look, Jack Hobbs is a is a great gift that keeps on giving from GWS. I mean, yeah. um, Travis Cloak was spooked out of it by the end. I mean. In the last quarter, there, what Travis just ran under the ball, and and Homs didn't even follow him, and backed himself in and took the mark. And uh, yeah, look, I, I think he's having a fantastic season. He, well, he's probably going to be a victim of uh, our poor form uh, through that middle patch of the season there, which might cost him all Australian honours, Forza. But uh, he's right up there. Yeah, no doubt. And look, in terms of the Phil Walsh thing, I mean, 
I had a bit of a tear in my eye when that was going on at the end. I mean, that was one of the most brilliant things I've ever been a part of. And, you know, you could see how much that meant to all the players on the field as well. Mm. The lights going off really highlighted um, the screen and made it all about feel, which is what it deserved yeah. to be. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah, ha- yeah, having the uh, the lantern um, swaying in the stands, everyone's mobile phones, it was, it was a beautiful piece of uh, football history. And what about your hate, Forza? Oh, the hate. Um, I think I'm going to have to go with Taylor Adams. I reckon he's... Uh, the sniper. You know, you look at you look at Westhoff, and up until that point, he was arguably our best player. He was absolutely on fire. He had, what, 22 disposals? Yep. A highest possession getter. He was destroying Collingwood everywhere. And basically, you know, it's pretty clear that Westhoff was targeted. And he was put down, and Adams obviously sunk the knee in, I don't know, two, three, four, five times. Um, Titus was right in that the match review panel had several different angles to to choose from with uh, regards to the knee in the head. Yeah. But after that, after that incident, Westhoff, you know, I, think, I think he finished the game with, what, 20, 26 disposals, 27 disposals. So he, he didn't really have much of the ball after that. He had four touches after that. Yeah, only had four touches. Yes. That's that's probably my hate that they, they take a, a player of ours who's playing so well and they just snipe him out of it in that fashion. It's it's just that's just ugly. Yeah. And it's not the first like it happened with Gray as well against Carlton and you know, against Carlton there was no stand up and fight, but you know, I'm I'm really thrilled to see Boak in particular get up and go right up to Adams after that incident. I saw him pointing the finger straight at him from the stands, and you could tell they were, you know, really getting into it. And then Boak won the free kick after that. So I'm glad that the the team stood up for Westhoff, and that sort of steeled them to to grind out the win. But just the whole snipe, yeah. of, I just hated it. No doubt. And look, that's a great that's a great segue into my love. Sorry, Rick. That's a great segue into my love, which is the aggression towards Taylor Adams after the Westhoff incident and. You know, after the replay on the screen, I mean, half the team went up to Adams and had a bit of a go and knocked him around and knocked him on his ass a bit. And, you know, credit to Adams, I guess. You know, it didn't seem to phase him much. And he was arguably best on ground after that. But, you know, to see Hartlett and Pittard and Boak and Loby and Trengove and, and Wines, you know, just target him, go up, you know, go up and physically attack him. It was great to see. And as you said, Forza, you know, it's something that we've been pretty critical of this year. And it was a pretty noticeable change. I think our players have been targeted all season um, and it's something that's happened quite often and, and got away with it, either by our playing group or by the umpires and I guess uh, what happened to um, Westhoff uh, was that enough um, to justify the uh, disappearance for the rest of the game. You know, he didn't seem to be too uh, limited so... Um, yeah, I don't know, but uh, he was a fantastic player until then, and and our reckons that I was too drunk to remember any of the game. <laughs> it's quite possible. Uh, and Kale said we should be looking in between the couch cushions for Forza. That's where he always loses something. <laughs> <laughs> so you, what well, look, was your love, Maka? My love was the aggression towards Taylor Adams after the, well, that's what, the West. That's offensive. what people have been crying for, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, it should have happened to Gibbs as well, but it didn't. And that probably cost us the game, I thought. You know, we, we sort of struggled after that. But, you know, it was really great. And especially after that, you could see Boak really rally the troops and say, you know, we're not going to let this one slip. So I thought that was fantastic. And look, in, in terms of Westhoff him, himself, it probably wasn't just that incident which caused him to sort of stop after half time. I think they put uh, someone like Tuvi on him and, and he played a bit more of a shutdown role. And you know, that was a massive mistake by Buckley putting, um, what, second game of Darcy Moore on, on Justin Westhoff. Mm. That was great for us. Oh, absolutely it was, yeah. <laughs> and look, my, my hate this week was uh, the skill level at the Magpies on the weekend. And look, some weeks they look uh, they look pretty decent, but other weeks, such as Saturday, they look absolutely pathetic. And there was just zero composure with the bowl. There was awful decision-making and, and just plain bad skills. I mean, for a period in that third quarter, I reckon they kicked it either out on the full or direct to an, a, an opponent, probably more than they found their own teammates for a good 20 minutes there. And 
it was that 20 minutes that arguably lost us the game in the end. And, you know, it's not good enough. And probably questions need to be asked about why this is happening and why some of these players' skills haven't really improved. But this is a... Um, it reminded me of our trials and tribulations at AFL level. So oh, Absolutely, yeah. And I'm starting to wonder, is it, is it the game plan? Because it reminded me exactly of the same stuff we see when the Power Boys are playing. They yeah. seem to be pushing it so wide to the boundary that they kick it out on the full or just very stagnant. And what about that? Fa- Who did the kick out from the point straight to the North, uh, Simon Phillips? No, I can't remember. And I thought it might have been Beeman's. Um, looked like him anyway, but could have. Yeah. That was that was a perfect pass um, straight on to the head of uh, Simon Phillips. But yeah, I'm, I'm just starting to wonder. Um, yeah, you know, is that a game plan issue? I mean, I mean, what we end up kicking three goals for the game, or would we get a late one to uh, make it a bit closer? But it was pretty oh, we ordinary. A, we got a couple of late ones, I think. So I think yeah. we ended up with what five or something like that. But you know, when, when you're keeping the opposition sco- uh, uh, goalless in a half and to one goal in one of the other quarters, you generally should be expecting to win. But mm. you know, it, uh, it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, the thing that really worried me the most was a lot of those kicks that we took um, that went to the opposition were from our more experienced uh, players. More in- oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think he had a patch where three or four kicks in a row either went out on the floor or straight to an forward player. Now, when you're a 50-year utility at AFL level, 50 or 60-year utility, you shouldn't be kicking like that with that sort of frequency. You know, Palmer missing targets is one thing. He's a first-year player. You know, he's, he's learning learning the game and whatnot. But a player like Moore should not be having that many playing good kicks. Oh, no. In a, a lot of that. And, yeah, it is it is a very worrying sign because, really, we should have thumped Norwood by a good five, six goals, but we end up losing to him by a point, which is just so stupid. Yeah, I mean, it's happened, what, probably two or three times in the last couple of years, nor winning by not all that much. And, you know, I think it happened earlier this year as well where we were pretty well on top at half-time and they came out after half-time and just blew the game away in the third quarter. So, I don't know, there's, uh, there's something going on there and, you know, to lose by a point to Nord is never a good thing. No, no. Especially after we keep them goalless for a, a half. Yeah. Not acceptable. And Rick, yeah, what was your love and hate, mate? I loved our leadership group. I thought our leadership group really stood up, especially when the heat was on. Um, I'm going to say Hamish Hartlett, um, Travis yep. Boat, Robbie yep. Gray, even though he's not in it, um, Justin Westhoff, even though he's not in it, uh, but all, and Ollie Wines, even though he's not in it. They're still leaders of our club. And, and all the guys that we needed to stand up stood up. Yeah. Oh, Wines is in the leadership group, Rick. Oh, there. is he? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. I, I missed that one in the one of the presses. So, uh, but I mean, he's a leader in his own right, anyway, just with the way that he plays on the field. So, and I mean, his start to the game was just monstrous. And it was. Um, yeah, all of them were fantastic. They all rose for the occasion, and um, it's exactly what we've been looking for. And you know, everyone's been now talking about it. it's not the bottom six; it's the it's the top six that we need to uh, push along. And uh, and they dr- they drove the agenda for the whole game. So um, I thought that was fantastic. And look, I guess my gripe was the bloody obnoxious moron Collingwood supporters in the RAA lounge that just were inflammatory and feral. And half of them couldn't even wear any um, Collingwood paraphernalia, but they were Collingwood supporters. Go figure. So um, <laughs> it really was a, it was really satisfying us winning by three points at the end of the game while they they were literally kicking the chairs and footstools and smashing the glass, um, you know, and really? punching the glass. Oh, they were in a corporate like, area. They didn't actually smash the glass windows, but they were punching the glass windows and yeah, f and this and oh, bloody umpires and. Yeah, kicking the chairs, the whole lot, the biggest dummy spit. You, it was disgraceful, and it, it was so annoying. And one of my, I took one of my clients who's a North Melbourne supporter, and he hates Port, and even he was 
happy that Port won by the end of the game because, yeah, they were, it was woeful. And some people just need to get a bit of decorum. You know, you can still support your team without being completely obnoxious and inflammatory to the opposition. But anyway, there you go. I'm surprised they didn't get kicked out. Oh, them? Yeah, they yeah. got away with it. I don't know. I mean, I guess I could have been precious and complained, but I'd rather just uh, sit back and drink another beer. Mm. Maybe I need an owl there. Owl would have been in their face. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Look, we've had a tweet from Bevan as well, and he loved the amount of smothers on Thursday night, which is a very good point. Um, also, that homsch tackle on Cloak, which was an, an absolute ripper, and, and the Chad from the pocket, which uh, is becoming a, a bit of a regular thing from the Chad. Mm. The Chad is the man. Best forward pocket in the AFL at the moment? Oh, I think probably best forward flanker, I would say. Yeah. Yep. All right. Best small forward? Oh, probably. Yep. Mm. He'd have to be. He's kicked probably the most goals out of anyone the last uh, month, wouldn't he? There's oh, certainly, yeah, yeah, certainly in the last more month. attention than Chad Does, Oh, probably. But he's also a... Uh, He's also playing for a big, you know, top four Victorian club. So, mm. you know. Should that matter? It shouldn't matter. No, but uh, it does. Yeah, but... It does uh, It does happen. So, that's the thing. Look, Rio, as I said on the boards, I think there was a bit of a discussion about Rioli on uh, on the general AFL thread um, uh, during the Hawthorne game. And, and I said that Rioli's basically like Byron was. You know, he's... Uh, doesn't get a lot of possessions, but he's a high impact finisher, and that's all he is and all he's ever going to be. And you know, he's never going to be a, a regular sort of twenty disposal a game sort of player like uh, Chatty is. Mm. But that's what makes uh, Chad Wingard so special, and you know, one day he'll actually get the kudos that he deserves. After his sixth or seventh All Australian gig. Oh, probably seventh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's he's surely on form. Well, he's averaging over twenty disposals and two goals a game. And I think Tribe pointed out there's no one else doing that at this point in time, is there? No, there's not. No, he's uh, he's on his own. Now. So, what did you guys think of the game? Well, we'll talk about that now. You know, Thursday night footy, Port Adelaide in round fifteen, and yeah, you know, we came away with what I thought was uh, one of our wins of the year, and so, certainly a, a very emotional three point victory. Nine goals, twelve to nine nine. Uh, Wingard kicked three and Gray kicked uh, two for the winners. Um, before the game itself, Thursday night footy, you guys a fan? No, um, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan at all. And why aren't you? A, why aren't you a fan, Borza? I am a fan. I'm a fan. Are you? Yeah, I just walk over from work. No drama for me. I work at the Adelaide Uni, so I just sit at my desk until close to game time and then just stroll on over. So for me, it's it's fantastic. Beautiful. For me, as an old fella trying to recover post-game, it's a lot harder. I actually had to have the day off on Friday because I was a bit hungover. And, um, Control sorry. yourself, Rick. I thought I did. <laughs> I still don't know what happened. I swear someone must have spiked my drink. Because uh, I don't know what happened there, but I'm never that bad. But uh, I can tell you, I was the pits. So um, I say no to Friday, uh, Thursday or Sunday football. So I've got enough time to recover to still get to work. Lucky I'm the boss. That's a fair point. I like Thursday night footy, but with an asterisk. And I would like it a hell of a lot more if I didn't live 250 kilometres from Adelaide and... <laughs> didn't, get, didn't get home at uh, quarter past one in the morning on a work night. Uh, that's probably the only thing that I didn't like about it. But If I lived in Adelaide, him, I'd love it. Do you have to ask your employer to maybe leave a little bit earlier and stuff like that, get the all clear? Nope. No, I was able to leave at um, five on the dot and uh, and got to the game with probably about uh, 20 minutes to spare, I guess. So. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So that, mm. would, uh, that worked out well. So it was good. But, Maybe um, you need yeah, to do what I do. Get, getting at home, sort of, you know, the next day is uh, probably not great, and uh, you know, it might stop me from going in the future, I guess. But um, look, uh, you, you couldn't miss that game. You couldn't miss that game at all. Maybe you need to schedule like an annual leave day for the Friday. So yeah, could have done that. Could have done that, but uh, didn't want to. So just thought I'd uh, t- toughen up and go to work the next day and talk about what a fantastic game it was. Would have sucked if we lost, eh? Absolutely. 
Yep. Well, why, what makes it so attractive um, for Adelaide fans in general? Because both supporter groups seem to steam, seem to still go. And Elaine, Elaine uh, Muller has already said, uh, sent in a tweet saying Thursday night, great for free-to-air media coverage as well. Yeah, look, it is. I, I think for the AFL, it's fantastic. You know, it's another, it's another time slot where there's not another game on. So they've got complete control over that. Um, you know, it's fa- fantastic for the fans, I think, that they're able to get to the game. And look, I think it's it's good for Adelaide because I think Adelaide fans like um, night games. You know, we, we all love going at night time. Adelaide Oval is a fantastic place to go for, for night time footy. Um, and that's why I love Thursday night games. Um, yeah, I, I think it'll be a winner. I think it's something that they'll, um, that they'll uh, continue with over the next few years. Is it because we're starved of... For both uh, supporter groups, we're starved of key match fixtures, I guess, that when we do get them, we just embrace them. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, every, as I said, I think everyone loves, you know, nighttime footy, primetime footy, you know, Saturday Arvo, Sunday Twilight's not all that great, I don't think. But, you know, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, it's an absolute winner. Yeah, I think in this state we generally like the nighttime footy because it, it frees up our weekend. You know, it's go to the football on Thursday night or Friday night. You got Saturday and Sunday to do whatever you want. Although back at you know Amy Stadium days, a trip to the footy was literally half your day, and I, I know that's your case every time now, Maka, because you live far yeah. away. But but for a lot of people in Adelaide, going to Adelaide Oval is only now three, four hours. You know, so it's. It's definitely a, a big plus to having a night time, I reckon. I think we're quite fussy with how we spend our weekend days. Yeah. I think we're still getting used to the fact that, hey, we're, we're playing in the city. We can go out afterwards. We can go out beforehand, have a good time, you know, get some drinks after the game and that sort of thing. So I think that's why uh, nighttime footy in, in uh, South Australia is pretty special. And that's what I took advantage of. <laughs> no doubt. I've got, I've got to ask the question here. Are we making a rod for our own back, though, by being so supportive of the fixture uh, that the AFL is going to want to give us more of that fixture even though a lot of supporters don't want it? Do a lot of supporters not want Thursday night footy? Or... Well, I get the feeling... Um, I think a lot of supporters do, actually. Yeah, yeah 40, oh, awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know. If anyway, we had a choice of Thursday night footy or Saturday afternoon footy, I know which one I'd be picking. Saturday Arvo. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be that one. <laughs> I would. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because Saturday Arvo is great. You go to the game and then you can go out to the town at, and it's, what, 7 o'clock and you go out for dinner and you can party on and be home by 10. Awesome. Yeah. Fair enough. That's fair enough. And you can even go to the corporate box and have some lunch beforehand, pump in the drink. Sorry, my phone's ringing. And uh, even better. Hey, and Scott S has just tweeted in, um, Ryder said after the game that our plan was to kick along the boundary line just for that match, or is that our regular game plan? I never heard anything along those lines. Did you? No. No? No. That no. can't be our game plan. It's were we, were we doing that? I didn't think we were doing that much at all. Uh, oh, not really. It wasn't as, as noticeable. Our game plan wasn't... The flaws weren't as noticeable as uh, previous games. And it was bucketing down with rain, so I guess we were always going to sort of hug the boundary just as, as Collingwood did, you know, and hope for bowl-ups and try and shut the game down a bit. But, you know, I, I thought we, we attacked the game more than we have just about all year, apart from the Hawthorne game, but... Yeah, you know, and what a huge, important first quarter that was. You know, four goals up at quarter time, and you know it probably could have been more if Wingard had his radar on early and, and missed a couple of, of really gettable goals. But you know, I thought we dominated in the midfield and just had options everywhere up forward. And you know, as you said, Rick, a moment ago, you know, um, Ollie Wines was massive in that first quarter and really sort of led from the front and and you know put the game almost on ice to quarter time. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm just typing a message. Um, yeah, it, uh, Ollie was huge. And as Forza pointed out, I thought um, Justin Westhoff was amazing. What role, was he just playing that floating role, you reckon? Was he, it was almost like a wingman, wasn't he? He was just um, 
uh, forward and back, but it was just in the link up play. And, and this is the um, and this is the West off that we um, that we really love as a player, and we want to see uh, more often. But um, and I thought Tebow stood up as well. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think Westhoff was starting at centre half forward and, and floating around more up the ground, you know, sort of leading up into the midfield a bit. And as I said before, he was playing on Darcy Moore. He's played one game of AFL footy, and it would be a, a good learning lesson for Darcy. And and certainly, I guess that's why Buckley chose to make that match up. But you know, it really wasn't a great match up for them. And you know, Westhoff was best on ground at half time and absolutely tore him a new one. Mm. I agree. And what did you guys think of uh, Paddy Ryder? Did you did you like his influence in the game? Was he a little bit better? Huge, massive. Yeah, yeah. that was, that was one of the best games he's played. Yeah, one of the best games he's played all year. And certainly in the ruck, I thought his ability to get the hands on the ball and and direct it to our midfielders was uh, was pretty special. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's really important that he had a big one, especially after uh, Loeb got that knock really early on. I'm, I'm not sure if anyone really noticed, but in that first passage of play when Wines kicked the ball forward and Schultz missed the mark and it went out, uh, Loeb copped a huge knock at the next throw-in, and he was on the ground for a, a good few minutes after that. I think he jogged off the ground after that, but from that point, it was pretty lame. So it was uh, very important that Ryder was able to step up as he did. Yeah. And look, it wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect. There were still periods of play where, you know, Collingwood got well on top in the in the midfield battle and, you know, came away with, you know, two or three really quick clearances and, and got a couple of goals out of them, you know, especially in the second quarter. And I think they kicked, what, two goals in a minute in the last quarter as well. But, you know, so, so there's still room for improvement. But, um, you know, it, it was a big step forward from what we've seen um, in recent weeks. Was there a reason that all the goals were being kicked at the southern end? Or was it just coincidence? I think it was just coincidence. It certainly didn't seem windy or anything out there. Well, why did, boys, why did we... um, We kicked away twice, and then did we allow Collingwood back in the game? Or were Collingwood just good enough to bring themselves back into the game? I I think Collingwood are, are just good enough. Yeah, I mean, you look at their stats and... All their big names had massive games. You know, Taylor Adams had 38 touches, Swan 33, side bottom 31, Pendlebury 29. You know, that's uh, you know that's just about their what, their best four players, and they all had huge games. So you know, they stood up for them, and it was probably as we've been critical of, I guess maybe uh, a little bit as well. But you know, it was probably their sort of bottom six or seven players that let them down, I guess, and and didn't really stand up. But yeah, I, I think Collingwood are, are a pretty good side at the moment, and. You know, they were always going to come back and, and it was up to us to sort of, you know, steady the ship and that's what we did. Mm. Yeah, there's certainly a form side of the competition at the moment and a real positive for me was one thing that's, that I've been critical of with, with Port is when we have a lead and we lose it, we just don't get it back. Whereas on Thursday night, Collingwood got in front of us but were able to wrestle back the lead and then hold it for the rest of the game. And that's something we haven't really seen much all year. So if you look at the Carlton game, you know, we kicked away, but Carlton never got the, uh, the Carlton game, the Hawthorne game, we kicked away. But if Hawthorne got the kick in front of us, we probably would have lost that game. Yeah. And there's other times where we've fallen behind and just haven't been able to, to get back. We got close, but not, not been able to get back. So... Yeah, that was I think they had something like eight scoring shots in a row to start the second quarter, and you know, I, th- I think Gus Monfries kicked a goal to sort of you know stem that and, and stop that from happening. But yeah, you know, we got back in the game after that, and it was a pretty good third quarter as well. Especially after, um, as we spoke about the West Off incident, I thought the the team really sort of rallied together and and made sure that um, yeah we we sort of break away a little bit. Yeah, the last yeah. half was a really good grind. It's a really really good grind. We're able to to hang tough and, and really fight it out, which is something that we haven't really seen where the opposition would tend to get on top of us, but we're able to hold fast and protect the lead, especially in the last. Mm. I felt like the game, like from Collingwood's perspective, maybe lacked 2 or 3% the intensity around the contest, which 
other teams have really brought to us this year. And uh, I reckon that was one of the main differentials, which they just gave us that little bit more extra time and space uh, to be able to use the ball a bit more effectively. Is that how you guys saw it? Or do you think we were able to just create the time and space ourselves? It's an interesting call that, Rick, because they had, I think they had uh, something like nine more tackles. They had 10 more clearances and, and 20 more contested possessions. So in terms of the stats, they actually were able to uh, to win that hard bowl and, and, uh, and, and get away with it. But I actually thought it was their skill level. I thought their skills let them down, especially in, late in the last quarter, probably the last 10 minutes. They were just sort of banging it blindly forward. And I think, as you said earlier, Forza, you know, Jackie Holmes was sort of marking everything in sight. And Matty Broadbent was, took a couple of really good marks. And, you know, Brendan Archie as well. And, you know, I thought our skill level was something that was uh, was notable, was, was something that was pretty good on, on Thursday night. And that's certainly not something I've been able to say all year. Mm. That's still it. Yeah. It was great. Sorry, Forza. I um, I still think the game just lacked a little bit of around the ball intensity to what we have seen uh, often this year. That that was just the observation ob- observation that I made this year. But maybe uh, maybe the alcohol was just creating a false <laughs> sense of uh, relaxation on my part. That's it. Well, probably the the one thing that really. Like I, th- I think we were pretty much on top of Collingwood for most of the game. Like at one point at the end there, we were, what, five points, five, six points up. And the difference was in the points kicked, not in the not in the goals kicked, you know. So if we had converted those five points into goals, we would have been holding an extra, you know, three, three goal lead than what we were holding on to. Uh, you know, if our goal kicking was better, and it's been a bit cactus all year we probably would have been much further in front of Collingwood and they wouldn't have got as close to us as they did you wouldn't have situations where Taylor Adams you know, completely ours as a goal from the boundary line yeah. trying to hit, hit the, the goal square mm. yeah. Scott S has found us the link to um, Paddy Ryder might be a little bit awkward for me to listen in while we're doing the show but um We'll have a listen in afterwards and uh, and see what he's got to say. Sounds good to me. Um, that last quarter was uh, how was everyone feeling in that sort of last ten fifteen minutes? I guess for me, it felt like it was almost inevitable that Collingwood were going to hit the front. It just felt like that sort of game. But I don't know. Maybe I should stop feeling like that. As I've said a few times, we seem to be really good at saving a game when we're in front and we certainly did the same thing against Hawthorne where they were sort of peppering inside 50 and we were able to, to stop them from getting in front and we did exactly the same thing against Collingwood on Thursday. You're such a pessimist, Macca. I am. I am. You I'm need probably... to <laughs> embrace it. Go for it. Sorry, mate. That's all right. I, I probably wasn't as worried as I normally would be and yeah, the reason for that is Collingwood had a lot of inside 50 kicks but you know, I think it was you, Rick, I said they just kicked blindly into into our defensive 50. So more often than not, you know, Broadbent will take the plus one mark or Pittard will take the one plus mark or Homsch. And they, you know, they're able to have the extra number back there all the time. So when you're in that situation, it's not likely that they're going to be able to score. You know, there are a couple of scary moments with like O'Shea running back to save a goal and whatnot, but... And you know, the fact that we're able to do that and save the goal, that sort of made me feel that, you know, we're going to be able to hold on here. Yep. Can we? Can I just say that I was disgusted that Brendan Archie was um, the sub. I, uh, I thought that was a completely undeserved call. And uh, again, as a sub, I thought he did his part. Uh, but he thoroughly deserved to play a four-quarter game on the weekend. <clears throat> yeah. I think he deserved to play a four-quarter game, but I actually thought it was a pretty smart move having him as sub, especially as an inside midfielder to come in you know, late in the game when, when it's wet and it's going to be contested and lots of stoppages. I thought that was a, a pretty smart move. Yeah, I mean, hindsight would suggest that maybe Amon was the better sub. Um, and again, it just comes back to giving the young players confidence. And because Portia and I had a discussion about that on uh, Wednesday night, 
and sort of just sending the message to the, especially the younger boys, hey, we're going to back you in. I was, I was actually talking that, at that point in time about starting Archie on the ground and not on the bench, um, just to give him that confidence that we, uh, we have faith in you as a player. Um, so, yeah, I just wonder, you know, I'd hate to see Brendan have a, a sub game and then he's like, oh, we need to drop him because we need a, uh, we need to give him a full four-quarter game again. I, I would be very heartbroken for Brendan if that was to happen. It's a bit of a nonsense excuse though, Rick. Whenever the coach says that, you know they're just fluffing about just to try to find an excuse because it's just as easy to give him a full game at AFL level than it is at SNFL level, really. Of course it is. That's right. It's just come out and I, say I'd it. expect him to get a full game this week. I thought well, he was pretty good as sub. I, I thought he was pretty good. And once again, he, he made a couple of really smart handballs. And the, the thing I really like about his handballs is even if he, even if he's getting tackled and has his hands sort of caught, he's still able to get an effective handball off, which is a, a pretty important thing and, and something that not a lot of players can do. He's got a very mm. strong core. Very, yeah. very strong. And it, remind, it actually reminds me of a young um, Sean Burgoyne, where they're just able to get themselves free and either run off or just be able to handball the ball off. So I, I think he's got a he's definitely got a very good future if he can keep building on what he's managed to do this year. And in the game, that mark at the end that he took, that contested match saving mark on the 50 meter arc, that was just that was just phenomenal. That as soon as he took that, he just he just knew this kid's going to... He's, he's really got a future ahead of him. Absolutely. We, uh, shall we talk quickly about the controversial Cam O'Shea? The controversial Cam O'Shea? I thought he had a fantastic game. I, I know. I relate Cam O'Shea to like your favourite pair of track pants. You just feel better with him in the team, I, th- I think, and you just feel better with your favourite pair of trackies on, I guess. <laughs> I, I feel much more happy with him down back than I do a couple of other players that have played a lot more footy this year, but... Yeah, and he performed his role to absolute perfection. He, d- he didn't get a lot of the ball. He certainly didn't get a lot of the ball, but you know, he was able to sort of get in the way and, and come up as that third man quite a few times and, and perform some really important spoils and, and a couple of important marks as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. On the quarter, you just knew. You just knew he was on. And it was like, where has this bloke been all year? You know, he played He played earlier on in the year, and it was he was... Uh, pretty poor and I'm sure he'd be the first to admit he was pretty poor and I guess his form at SANFL it was improved but his game against the Crows was pretty average so for him to come in is a bit of a big call from the, the coaches but he repaid the faith and he's finally proven that he deserves to hold a spot in the team yeah. yeah I didn't think he deserved to be selected um, his form was pretty average, but um, he got his opportunity again. And unlike the first time, he played fantastically. Maybe um, having Bobby and Jonas out of the side allowed for that balance uh, for him to play a more confident and better brand of football. Um, perhaps maybe when Tom Jonas is in the side, his role's a little bit different and he's a bit confused. They obviously play a similar similar position but um, yeah he was uh, he was fantastic and I know Porsche would be very very happy that Cam had a great game and probably be in the side for the rest of the year hope so let's hope so I guess the other one to talk about um, of the younger guys is Carl Amon and I guess his was just about the most talked about performance from the weekend and you know considering he's only played four games um, you know how did you guys see his game I thought he was a bit, um, it was a bit, I don't know, just, he didn't quite know what he was doing in, in patches, if that makes sense. And, you know, some people on the forum saw that as him, you know, backing out of contests. I didn't actually see that myself at the game. I just saw him not looking quite sure. Sometimes he was, he was running super fast and he was really into it. Other times he just looked like, he was, you know, running at Matthew Lobby's speed. He was just way off yeah. the pace. So it was a bit hot and cold, but I think as the game wore on, he got into it a little bit more. So it was probably a, a good learning experience for him. I, I wouldn't want to see him dropped on the back of it because I think he did sort of 
pick it up and respond, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. He looked he looked nervous. I don't know if you guys have ever played sport, but he just um, he looked very heavy legged, and he was he, yeah, and that's so maybe the prime time forty five thousand people got to him a little bit, um, and I, I don't think he's a, a squib of a player because I thought his previous game before he um, went out. He made some really hard physical contests at the opposition players, uh, good body work. So I think the nerves created a bit of indecisiveness, like you're saying, Forza, which then maybe stopped him from committing to a contest. Maybe he thought he was going to be too late, didn't want to get reported or or whatever, and it sort of became a bit of a downward spiral from there. But, yeah, I think he just had a, an average game like everybody does, and uh, he'll bounce back from it. No doubt. It was his intensity at the contest which was a bit disappointing. And as you said, Rick, I'm not sure he handled the pressure of the occasion as well as he could have. Whether he squibbed or not in that contest against Dual Sidebottom, I'm not too sure. Maybe he did lose the ball in the lights or in the shadow or something, I don't know. But at the ground, it looked like he pulled out. And certainly there was uh, there was two players that went up to him straight after that and had a bit of a go and, and told him to sort of, you know, keep his eye on the ball, that sort of thing. And <clears throat> I guess um, even just taking that one away for a minute, I thought, um, you know, his, his lack of tracking back on Elliot cost us a goal. You know, he just sort of ball watched a little bit and didn't follow his man. And there's probably three or four other occasions as well where I reckon I said at the ground, come on, Carl, you've got to go harder than that. Um, but look, I'm a huge fan. Is that anyone knows that listens to this podcast regularly, everyone knows I'm a huge fan of Carl Amon and I reckon he's got a great future in front of him. And I think he'll actually be a lot better for that sort of game. And, and hopefully he gets another game this week and, and can show what he... Uh, can do against the Crows. How the ultimate flamers saying he was lonely esque. <laughs> well, it's probably half a fair call, but I don't know. I guess you're allowed one of those sort of incidents and we'll see how he bounces back. Yes. As I you agree. said, Forza, I thought his, uh, his last quarter was pretty good and certainly some of the things he did in the third quarter were pretty good as well. So he did bounce back during the game and, you know, I actually thought he'd get subbed out at half time, but there you go. Yeah, it was looking like he was going to get stubbed out, but Loby, I think, was sort of like at that stage of his more pace. But you know, it's a good thing that he did, and he played the full game. I think this was his first full, full game where he is there at the start and there at the end. Um, so, you know, if, if, you, if you keep that in mind that this kid's only played a handful of games, and this is probably the first full game from Go to Woe. He's, you know, he's, he's learning and he's doing well. And I, I, I don't think he's going to be a, a, late, a Nathan Loney or a Loney brother type type sort of player. He, he just no. wasn't sure whether to go in or not go in. Playing an outside role, do I go in now? Do I not go in? Do I wait? You know, it's he'll he'll get better as he as he matures. Yeah. Tommy Cleary, he had a pretty good game on Jesse White, and again took a couple of really nice marks as well. Yeah, yeah, he's. Um, it's great that we have a key defender that can come in and do a job if we lose one of our first choice key defenders. You know, it's something that we haven't really seen on our list for a. I don't know if we've ever had that sort of luxury where we've been able to bring in another key defender. Maybe in 2007 when Carlisle was um, earning the trade and he was sort of switching places with uh, Wakeland. But to have a, a plug-and-play key defender that can come in and do a job is pretty pretty good. It's not something we've been used to. I no. thought it was, it was pretty good. I think the, the key from our perilous position that we're at at the moment is that um, we keep seeing games from the uh, Amons, the Cluri, the Arch, um, because they're our future. And um, we just need to keep backing them in. And uh, I thought Cleary was uh, very serviceable. Uh, obviously, he'll keep improving, but um, that's only going to come by regular AFL game time, which is obviously a far superior standard to SANFL, and we've seen it numerous times this year. It's taken our boys a couple of games to be able to uh, adjust to the tempo of the game. Yeah, the other thing is, I'm sure it's been said before, but for Cleary to re-sign, when he's out of contract and you have Trengo, Tomsch, 
and Carlo ahead of you, and they're not, you know, they're not old. They're young guys. You know, really is a is a big thing for us to be able to hold on to a player of that caliber that wants to stay at the club and, and mature with the club. And you know, we we're going to have injuries. You know, Trengove, unfortunately for us, is quite injury prone. So Cleary is going to have his opportunities every year. And yeah, it's it's just great that he's um, able to come in and be serviceable and a reliable key defender for us. That's it. Mm. <clears throat> There's a couple of senior players that had probably their best game for, for quite some time, and that was uh, Gus Monfries, who uh, was let off the leash a little bit and, and had, a, had an absolute ripper game, I thought. He had something like 23 touches and a goal um, playing on uh, Adam Oxley and, and ran him ragged. And I thought Matty Broadbent had his best game for a long time as well. And, you know, just uh, it's great to see him back in form and, and uh, getting a lot of the ball down back and, uh, and using it as effectively as he is at the moment. Yeah, massive last quarter. Mm. Yeah, the plus one twenty kicks, putting himself in the uh, the exact spots to take the intercept marks. He was uh, yeah, it's back to his best, which was really mind freeze in particular. You know, the bloke's been playing a defensive role for probably the last two months now, it's almost all year really. So for him to be able to actually attack as an attacker, it's uh. Yeah, it was great to see that you know he he does still have it. He's not droppable, and you know even when he's been defending, he's been doing really good jobs on the opposition's uh, attacking defenders there. So it's great that he could have some more freedom. He had freedom, all right. How often was he um, running the far flank on his own, coming into um, space inside fifty? It was amazing. No, he was um, not being picked up much at all. I. Um, I thought the one takeaway I thought, which I think highlights our season, but I, I, I sort of had an epiphany on it on Thursday night, was our, um, our decision-making. And in the first quarter, we had the perfect example, if, you, if anyone can be bothered watching the replay. Jay Shields takes a mark. Uh, has Jarman MP running by his side for the handball receive? Um, now, he could have waited for Jarman to run past and handballed it over the top of the man on the mark to a running Jarman MP. Or Jarman MP could have ran a little bit wider, giving himself more space to the man on the mark. Either option would have worked, but what happened was Schultz just telegraphed a handball straight to this Jarman MP running past, um, who was then proceeded to be tackled and corralled by the man on the mark. And, and to me, that, that sort of was a highlight to me of, I think, where our season has almost gone a little bit wrong, um, where we, we just haven't probably thought a few of our plays through well enough when you compare, and I hate doing this, but when I compare it to a well-oiled machine of Hawthorne, where they do not make those sort of mistakes with their game plan, running into or creating holes and creating space. And... I think our boys' um, maturity is still growing into the game plan that Ken wants them to play, and uh, I believe they're still learning how to execute properly, and um, it's not all doom and gloom, and I I think that we might see an improvement in the the remaining games this year and definitely coming into next year. I'm I'm becoming more reassured by that now. Yeah, it'll click at some point. Does yeah, it'll click at some point. Yeah? Yeah. No, there was definitely three or four occasions where you thought, you know, you just have to think that through a bit better and, you know, we could have run it down the, the length of the field and probably scored a goal, but in the end they were tackled or it went out of bounds or something like that. But I guess another player that I want to mention is Hamish Hartlett, who uh, you know, had his lowest disposal count for the year. He only had 14 touches, but he had probably just about the most influence he's had on a game all year. Um I thought it was a wonderful effort by Hamish, and and certainly a, he was he was harder at the ball than he has been in recent weeks. Um, you know, he, he laid a couple of really crunching tackles, and you know he had a massive influence on the uh, on the result. Oh, he was desperate. It was fantastic to see the, the amount of smothers he did and the repeat efforts. You know, to, and as you say, Mac, yeah, to have impact on a game the way he had is something we haven't seen probably. Not probably since uh, the Hawthorne game, really. Yeah. You know, for most of the year, he's been getting you know twenty touches, maybe kicking a goal here and there, and 
you know, so his numbers have been all right, but you can't really remember what he did in the game or whether that had any actual effect on, on the outcome. But this game, he was easily one of his best games of the year, and not because of his possession count, but just what he was able to do, all the stuff that you don't see in the kicks and the handballs and the marks, you know, with his, his, his mothers and his... Uh, and the few possessions he did have, he did manage to hit really good targets. Yeah. So it was great to see. It really was. I loved his physicality, his blocks, mm. his one percenters. I thought they were fantastic. And uh, just more of that. Use his more size around the contest. Yeah, more. Just more. Him and Hoff, more. Just start delivering that on a consistent basis and, you know, the supporters will be happy. I see. He's, he's actually a hard player. He's a really hard at it player and it's great to see him be that hard player that you know he can be and you know it's we haven't seen that um all year like probably the last time we saw it was in the richmond final where he you know range head on into um uh whoever that chap's name is steve morris morris that's right you know that's the kind of stuff hartler does he's a real in there hard player so for him to get back to that and play that hard game uh, was really, it was terrific to see. That's it. Jarman Impey, is that the best sidestep since Robert Harvey? Oh, that <laughs> shimmer. <laughs> I, call, I called it a shimmer. It was, we were right from that box, Macca, we were right behind him and the goals. And it was such a, a little quick flick sideways. It, was, it reminds me of the Matrix when they see the cat come past twice doing a little shake. It was, um, yeah, it was an amazing piece of, piece of play, like, sort of like picking up the ball in between your legs. It's, yep. uh, he's got a bit of bling about him, hasn't he, Jars? He does. He's got a lot of bling. Yeah. He's got a lot of bling. He's such a goal, unfortunately. It's a shame it was offline. Yeah. Yeah, that would twice. have been a ripper. Yeah. That would have been yeah. a great goal had he kicked that. I guess the last person I want to speak to, and we'd probably save the best to last, is Ollie Wines, who you, you just saw the raw emotion on him after the game and how much that meant to him and how much Walsh he meant to him as well. And, you know, for, for such a young kid, putting in these performances week after week, I mean, you know, another 33 touches, 10 tackles, I mean, eight clearances, he just dominated. Mm. Yeah, but... it was huge. Absolutely huge. It's... Uh... Yeah. He'll be, uh, he almost will make the uh, under 21 team of the year. Is that good, Macca? <laughs> might sneak in, yeah. say. He might sneak in. I mean, I'm just excited to see Ollie in two years' time, 100 games, and the comparisons would say Nate Fife, who is the, and deserves to be the bee's knees. Um, you know, he is right up there. And again, he's flying under the radar because he's not in a big Vic side. But I tell you, he is, he is having a huge influence on our side. He is an amazing young man. Not to, uh, to compare him to one of our arch rivals, but he's got so much Rashido in him at the moment. And you just hope that he has that same sort of career path that, that Rue did. Did Rue have a bit more pace? Oh... Maybe off the mark, maybe off the mark he did, and he's certainly able to play as a key forward and you know centre half back or something like that for a while. But um, I'm not sure Ollie's able to do that. But certainly in, in terms of his grunt work in the middle and his ability to get both contested and uncontested ball and you know get into scoring positions up forward and you know all that sort of stuff, I think um, he could be anything. And you know the sky's the limit. He could really be one of the top sort of two or three players in the competition. Mm. Oh, sure. I hope so. He's a freak. He is a he is an absolute freak of a player, and uh, he deserves all the uh, glory that he can uh, get. That's it. I still can't believe he slid to us. It's uh, don't know what Melbourne were thinking. Like this must be how Hawthorne feel with Franklin and and what Richmond and what Richmond were thinking. It's it's just it's can't understand it. No, that's uh, right. Let the player <laughs> fly past them. It was so obvious. Ollie Wines going with his best mate Jack Viney to Melbourne. It was so. It was just the most obvious pick ever, and they fluffed it. But yeah. More power to us, I guess. Hey. Exactly. Adam Apollo. <laughs> That's it. 
Well, how do we feel about this week? Are you a bit nervous about how the Crows are going to come out and perform, or do you think we'll we'll have them on toast? Toast. I think they're emotionally shot, which is understandable. Um, I, I, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for them to um, regroup this season. Um, and I think watch out for them next year. I think this can uh, be something to really drive them for next year, bonding as a group, sort of like the JMAC thing for our boys. But, uh, yeah, I, we, should, we should be able to have them covered, I reckon. Look, with all due respect to Adelaide Footy Club, I hope you, I hope you're dead right there. I hope they, um, I hope they come out and we, we smash them. To be honest, but I don't think that's going to happen. They will absolutely be playing this game like it's the last game they're ever going to play. Um, they will want to win this to respect Phil and pay tribute to him more than any other opponent you could think of. I think, and I would feel a lot better about this game, about this showdown, had the Crows won on the weekend. I think that would have taken a bit of pressure off them, but. I don't know. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be hell for leather out there. I think, and it's going to be a super tough game. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's quite a physical battle as well. Uh, the other elephant in the room, I guess, is: Do you think that we can still make finals? Well, we win this week, and it's uh, certainly a possibility. I, I guess the thing is that you know we we just can't really afford to drop too many games at the moment, so. Even if we win this week, I mean, you, you've probably only got to w- drop another one and you know, then you're back down to 10th or 11th and you're know, struggling a little bit, aren't you? Mm. Oh, I think you shouldn't even think about finals. Losing to Brisbane and Carlton in the manner we did, really. It's uh, At this point, to have eight losses and sitting 12th, you just try to win every week. And if you get to a point where you can say, oh, yeah, if we win the next couple, then we're going to play finals and you know fair enough we're facing what seven games we have to win eight games to to have a chance mm. to sneak in it's just you know we're so far back you might as well just focus on trying to win this week and as Mac has said I, I, I think the Crows are going to be coming out quite hard I think the West Coast game was the you know that's the, the raw emotion of playing you know it's still pretty soon it's, it's a week but it's still pretty soon since uh since Phil left us, so yeah. Now the Crows are going to have their closure on Wednesday with the funeral and and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So I think yeah. mentally that'll be a, a big moment for them. They'll be able to sort of go beyond that, and I think they'll be looking at this showdown where it's like, right, let's get back to business. Mm. Yeah, I think I think they'll be in a better mental space than they were against West Coast, and they'll probably be absolutely desperate to play the kind of football that. Phil would have taught them to play in his in his time when he was there, and that is the very hard at it, um, you know, phonetic uh, skills and efforts and just absolute work rate. And I can see that sort of game unfolding, and I think we can match that, and I think we can we can beat that. We certainly have the ability to do it, but given how we've gone in the first you know 14 weeks of the year, if we can sustain it for the fourth quarter, that's another question, but I think we can definitely match them and definitely beat them, for sure. Yeah. Well, look, I reckon if we can beat Adelaide, Giants, Essendon, Fremantle, Hawthorne, Bulldogs, and the Gold Coast, I reckon there might be a chance. So basically, if we win every other game for the rest of the year, we'll, we'll make the finals. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, you got me. <laughs> well done. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd see if I could sneak it in on you. But, uh, yeah, look, we're, we're pushing shit up here. And like you said, Forza, if we beat Brisbane and got and uh, Carlton, we would have been out of the eight on equal points. And, you know, we, we probably we would have been only one game out of the, <laughs> technically out of the top four. So no, the, rea- what- the reality is we should be on four more wins than what we are now at the very least. No, that's that's just like we shouldn't have lost to West Coast. We shouldn't have lost to Sydney. We shouldn't have lost to Carlton. Shouldn't have lost to Brisbane. You know, Richmond. We should have beaten them as well. It's you know, we're a far better side than what we've performed, which means we're not a very good side right now. So, no, that's right. So we'll see how we go. I'm uh, intrigued, and I can tell you, I won't be drinking as much this weekend. I'll be more, a lot more responsible. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's it. All right, well, we'll leave it there for now for this week and uh, well, for this podcast. And we'll catch up again on Thursday night and talk about the Crows game and, and the showdown and how that's going to run in a bit more detail. But uh, Forza, thanks for coming on, buddy. Thank you. Cheers. Did well, mate. Glad I got here yes. in the end. <laughs> that's it. Young Macca, you drive carefully, young man. Always Stay do. safe. Stay safe on those roads. Yeah, it's a bit uh, bit hairy out there at the moment. I've got it's, to a say, crazy, so. it's a crazy world out there, so take your time. Everyone drive carefully. Be patient. Gather your receipts. Get ready for tax season if you haven't already. It's, uh, it's a boomer. Everyone uh, is excited to get uh, their little refunds. That's it. All right, boys. Count the pair. Pair! Count the pair. Boys, though, both threatening with every passing minute. Back to full forward, off hands. Brown needed to trap it. Couldn't quite. Hassled out of it. Port Adelaide getting numbers. Wingard! No way! Staggering!